Uh, before I get going, I want to clarify one or two things about your subscription. When you take out a subscription with your um, with your school, it's a, a 12 month subscription and we give you one login for everybody in the school to use. You can share that login with anybody in your school, but please don't share it with people outside the school. So if you need parents to help with homework, that's fine, share it with the parents, but please don't go sharing it with third parties who are doing other things. It's, it is definitely a, an educational use thing. Um, Google can use it at home and at school, and you can log in as many pupils at once as you as you like, as you need to, to, to do what you need to do. Um, we have recently changed passwords. So annually, we have a, a license obligation in the Swarden survey that you have to change your password every year. We did that on the 29th of September. So if for some reason you feel you can't get into Digimap for Schools, but you feel you should get in, please double check what your password is. If you've forgotten your password or you need a reminder, please contact our help desk. They're on digimap.schools at ed.ac.uk, or you can pick up the phone. Um, Please also check that your contacts are up to date. Um, again, if you don't know who your main contact is, you can come and ask our help desk and they will happily fill you in. Um, it's good for us to have your up to date contact details so that we know when we send out the new password that it goes to somebody who's actually there and doesn't just bounce so you, you then um, are left a bit high and dry. We can't contact you unless we have your contact details, although you can always contact us, of course. Um, let's start with Digimap for Schools here. I want to draw your attention to one or two things at the, at the beginning. In the top right hand corner here, we have a series of settings. There's a little drop down arrow where you can edit your preferences. When we send you your password, we also send you a four digit PIN. So if you enter your PIN here, it will allow you to edit the settings. So the first thing we can edit is the name Digimap for Schools that appears in the top right hand corner. So it says Digimap for Schools here. I'm going to change this to something a bit frivolous just because I can, just to illustrate the point. Um, in this preferences, you can also choose to hide the saved maps tab. So the save maps function is here on the left-hand side. It allows you to save uh, maps for future so that you can go back to them at any point. Um, there's something we need to flag here that if you save maps with names and additional data on them, say you've got pupils' um, addresses or their, their home locations or locations of, of other things, do be aware that anybody who logs in to Digimap for Schools under your username and password will be able to see all the information on those maps. Now, some people are not comfortable with that, so we give them the option to hide the saved maps tab completely. So I'm going to do that just now to show you what happens. If I click this button here, it goes orange. I can click the save preferences like this. Now, nothing happens until I click the refresh button up here watch that this saved maps tab on the left hand side will disappear. So I've just clicked to, to refresh, the screen will reload and you'll see that the saved maps has disappeared. Now for the purposes of this webinar, it's not sensible for me to remove that. So I'm just going to add it back in, go back to edit my preferences, enter my pin code and click OK. And then I can unhide the saved maps tab and save preferences. And if I reload again, you'll see that saved maps tab will reappear. There it is. You'll also see that the name of my school in the top right hand corner has has uh, reappeared and changed. It no longer says Digimap for Schools, it says My School Rocks. You can put your own school name in there. Remember that only, um, only people who have the pin code can change that. So your pupils who are logging in, as long as you don't give them the pin code, obviously, uh, they won't be able to change that. Uh, OK, so let's move on to the major parts of, of Digimap for Schools. First of all, we have a map panel here on the right hand side and on the left hand side, we have a panel which lists all the different sorts of tools. So if you can, um, if you if you need to do anything, then looking at the tools on the left hand side is the option. So we're going to start by using the search box here on the top, uh, top left hand corner. I'm going to search for Norwich first. When I search, I just type the name in and I hit my return key. If you are um, using a tablet or a, a touch screen, you can hit the little search um, uh, magnifying glass there. So you'll get two sets of results. One will be places in the UK and one will be places for the world. So we're searching two sorts of gazetteer here. One is just the UK places and one is a global places. There aren't just place names in it. There are um, some major landmarks and tourist features as well, things like the Taj Mahal or the, the Eiffel Tower and Mount Everest and so on. Sometimes though you need to be a bit creative about what you search for so it's always worth having a look. Do also note that sometimes you'll need to scroll down this list if there are more places than appear on the one on the one list. So I'm going to start by clicking the top one and that will relocate my map to be 
place that I clicked on. And as you can see, we had a marker in the middle. When I close this search tab here, you'll find that the marker disappears even though the map doesn't move, move, move locations. In order to change the scale of the map, I can either use my scroll wheel on my mouse. If you're using a tablet or a touch screen, you can use a pinch zoom in and out. This is fairly standard stuff. Or on the right hand side here, there's a zoom bar where you can zoom in and out like this. So I just click the plus and minus buttons. As I do that, you'll notice that the maps will change. They don't change at every click, but they will change enough to show you a, an appropriate map for the scale of the map of the map that you're looking at. So as I zoom in, you'll see that we get into a more detailed version of the map. This particular one is probably familiar if you know the Ordnance Survey's Explorer series, which is the orange paper maps. This is the digital equivalent. If I keep zooming in, you get a bit more detail still and keep going. And eventually I get to the most detailed level, which goes in as far as the street level here. So you can see spot heights in the middle of the road. You can see the pavement edgings. You can see individual building outlines. The colors of the ground will also tell you um, what the ground cover is like and so on. There's a key on the left hand side here, which will give you an indication of what means what. So the different colored buildings are there. You've got glass houses and so on. Then all the roads and paths and tracks and all the different surfaces are also listed in the key there. As I zoom out, of course, you'll notice that the key will change as I go. It takes a little bit of time to refresh because it's loading quite a lot of information there. And as I keep going out there, I'm back to the Explorer series. If I keep going out a bit further, I get to what we know as the um, one to 50,000 data, which is the or a pink Land Ranger maps. This is the digital equivalent of those. Keep going out further still and I get to something that's more like a road atlas. Keep going further still and I get a much better view of the whole, of the whole country. You can zoom to the full extent by clicking this little button underneath the zoom bar. If I do this, this will zoom me right out to show me the global view. You can also use the little button at the top here to just drag a box like this and zoom in on a particular area. We have a compass button here, also in the top right, which will expand the compass like that. So just click on it again to, to minimize it again. Let's go back to the start. I'm going to click this refresh button, which will start again with everything that takes me right back to the beginning. So let me go back to searching for um, something new. We're going to find a school. I'm going to look for Newton Grange Primary School. Just type Newton Grange Primary School in here, hit my return key and it comes up with Newton Grange Primary School there in the search results. So if I click on that, I find that I have my marker right on the school. I'm going to use my scroll wheel to zoom in and we should find that the school outline appears on the map like that. Once I've gone as far in as I need to, I'm not going to go quite as far in as that. I'm just going to come out a little bit so we can see a bit more context. What I'm going to do first is to measure a route around the, around the school. Um, you may have heard of the Daily Mile. We have some learning resources in our learning resources uh, section on our website, which will cover the Daily Mile. Uh, the Daily Mile was set up by a teacher in Stirling who dis discovered that actually getting all her pupils up and running every morning get lots of oxygen into their brains was a really good idea. So she makes them run a mile around the school grounds every morning before they do anything else. Um, it's a fantastic way to get started. Although I can imagine that corralling um, a whole class or even a whole school worth of children to run a mile every morning is probably quite a challenge. Um, if you wanted to measure how far it was to run around your school, you can use the measurement tools here. So on the left hand panel, we're going to click on the measurement tools. I'm going to choose distance. This is a very simple operation. I just click with my mouse to mark each change of direction as I go around the school like this. So this is the way my children would have to run if they wanted to run right around the school. So I double click to finish the line. And as you can see, the line goes solid and it also comes up with a little tool tip that tells you how far the distance is that I've measured. So that's 336.6 meters. In the left-hand panel, it will give you both uh, metric and imperial measurements. Um, in case you need both. And obviously the measurements will be appropriate to the sorts of distances you're measuring. If you measure right across the United States, you'll get the different distance in miles and kilometers. If you measure right around the school, you'll get it in yards and meters. I can do the same for the area. If I click on the area button, I could now measure the rough area of the school. So I'm going to start in this corner this time. Whoops, trigger fingers. 
and I'm going to click to change the direction of each point where I want to change the shape of the school. And as you can see, all I'm doing is drawing a polygon around the school building like this, which will give me uh, uh, the area of the school. Now I'm doing this quite roughly because um, I'm in a hurry and I double click to finish. And as you can see, the line goes solid and the tooltip gives me 3,187.8 square meters. These measurements are temporary. So if you try to print this now, you will find that the measurements don't come up on it. The measurement tools are simply for measuring. They're not designed to be permanent annotations on the map. If you want to do permanent annotations on the map, we'll come to that in a minute because we'll use the drawing tools. For now, I'm going to delete these measurements by clicking this button here on the left, delete the measurements, delete all, and the measurements will disappear. So I'm back to my original map. Um, let's move on to the drawing tools then. So if I want to plot and measure my journey to school, we have a learning resource in our, on our website, which is, uh, relates to class travel and uh, thinking about teaching children how far they travel to school and who takes the longest journey, who takes the shortest journey, whether they travel by bus, by car, on foot, by bike, and is there a shortcut? Do they have to go on the major roads? Could they avoid the major roads? There's lots of things to discuss there. So first of all, I'm going to start with the drawing tools here, clicking the top tab on the left-hand side. I'm going to start by marking my house. I'm going to click the marker and when I click the marker button you'll see that a whole selection of markers opens. So I'm just going to use the big pink X here and mark my house here. If I want to change the colour of that I can do that so I just need to click the select button and hover over it and it goes yellow when I click on it and then I can change the settings here. So I'm going to turn mine into a great big green X like this. It's probably quite hard to see actually. Let's try a darker outline. There we go. Next, I want to measure the distance that I travel to school. So I'm going to use the line tool up here and I'm going to mark from my house, here's my front door, along the street. Again, I'm just clicking the mouse at each point to work out which direction I need to go in. And I'm double click to finish. Somehow, I've got a bit of an error there. Excuse me, let me just um, correct that so you can see it a bit better. Right, sorry, start that one again. I'll check the line tool here. I'm going to click on the map. Each time I want to change direction, I'm just going to measure my journey to school like this, and I'm going to double click to finish the line. I'm going to select the line here using the select tool. So hover over it, wait for the grab hand, Click it until it's yellow, that means it's selected, and then I can change the line settings here to give it uh, a different weight and different colour. So I'm going to make it red, and I'm going to make it dotted, and I'm going to make it five points so it really stands out. Click anywhere else on the map and you can see that my, my line has changed colour. If I now want to measure that distance, I can use the measure tool here, and this will allow me to label the, the line that I've just drawn with the length of the line. So I'm going to pick metric. I'm going to click on the line itself where I want the label to appear and then it will add my label for it. Now that's um, selected the line as well, so I can just click off there to, to make sure it's, um, it's red again so you can see it. Similarly, if I want to measure the area of my school, I can use a shape measurement here. I'm going to choose the polygon. This works in exactly the same way as the measurement tools did, so I click each corner of the building like this to measure the area. Again, I'm going to do this quite roughly because it's quite a complicated building. It would take me forever and you'd be very bored. Um, rough distance like this, clicking to change direction at every point, and then double click to close the polygon and fix it. And that gives me my shape. Oops, oops sorry, trigger fingers. Again, I can add the measurement to this. So I click the measure button and then I click on the, the polygon itself and it will add the measurement in meters squared for me. I can also change the fill settings. So let's make this one green and give it a dark green outline like that. And there I have my route to school. So imagine you could have 30 children in a class and you can add all their different um, home locations to the map. You could do this on a whiteboard in front of the whole class and each child can add their own home location. You could then measure the distances between each home location and the school and see who travels furthest to school who's closest, and some people who look closest may not actually be closest, depending on which way they have to walk. 
um, there's a lot of discussion to be to be had there. Okay, let me just check my script to make sure I don't miss anything. So if you wanted to add an image of your school, you can do this using this button here. So it's add image there. So what I'm going to do is to pick the point at which I want the image to add. I'm going to click on it and it will then ask me to find the file I want to add. So I'm just going to browse for this here and uh, here. In here, there we go. So here's my school. I'm open the file, and then I can click upload, and it will add the um, the image there. So as you can see, when I run my mouse over this image, I get a little grab hand, so I can pick the the photograph up, and I can just move it so that it makes sense in the location of the context of the rest of my map. So I'm going to now uh, add a grid reference to my map here so that I can tell what the grid reference of my primary school is. There's a grid reference button here. So I just click on this and then I click where I want the grid reference to be. So let's pick the front door of the school here and it will add a detailed grid reference according to the location that I've clicked. So the grid reference will change according to how zoomed in or zoomed out your map is. If you zoom right out to a Great Britain level, you'll get a much coarser grid reference than you will if you're zoomed right in like this. But as I zoom in and out, of course, that grid reference is, is fixed because that's the point at which I've, I've fixed it when I drew the map there. So now I'm going to save my map for later. I'm going to click this button here that says Saved Maps. It's the little filing cabinet icon on the left-hand side. If I click Save Map here, um, we give you the options to add a map title, a class name, and a pupil name. Those uh, headings are suggestions, they are not requirements. It doesn't matter what you put in those, but you need something that, in order, that enables the map to be identified uniquely when you come back to it. So I'm going to call this Newton Grange Primary School. Um, I'm going to put P7 as my class name and I'm going to put my name in here. As I said earlier, do remember that anybody else who logs in under your school username will be able to see this information. So if you have any concerns about data protection, just bear those in mind um, when, when you're doing it. So now click Save and you'll see that the map appears in the uh, left hand panel here. We can also go back to any previous maps that we've drawn. So I'm going to draw, let's see if I do one earlier this year. Click on this one. It will ask whether I want to replace the existing map. Or, or merge the drawings. I'm going to replace it to show you how I can recall what I've just done without losing any of it. So there's one I did earlier, true blue Peter style. If I want to go back to the map I've just drawn for you guys here, I can just scroll up the list in the left-hand panel, click on that, replace the drawings, and hey presto, there is the map that we just drew just now. It's all there. If you have the pin code, you can add and remove maps from the Save Maps panel as uh, as before. So you'll see the little uh, bin icon next to it and you can remove them like this by clicking that one. I'm just going to delete that one there. And then I can relock that. I can also rename maps and I can also set up a folder structure here. Um, so you might want to set up a folder for each class or for each project or something similar to that. Once you've finished doing that, you can click relock and then nobody can go and edit it without that pin code again. Next, I'm going to move on to the map selector here. So in the top left hand corner of the map, there's a drop down arrow that talks about uh, the different types of map that we have available. So the default one is the current Ordnance Survey map. That's the contemporary stuff. The radio buttons down the left hand side uh, and the right hand side of, of the slider allow you to select two maps to slide between the two. So we have the aerial imagery here. We have a 1950s map which isn't available until you zoom out a bit because it's a different scale. And we have the 1890s map, which is also only for a zoomed out scale. We have recently made a change to this. We used to have both an aerial layer and an aerial X layer. So we've removed the aerial X layer and added the X bit to the overlays in the left hand side here. So we'll come to those in a minute. Hold the thought on the overlays for now. 
what I want to show you is the way you can move between these two type between two types of map. So if we have the aerial imagery on one side and the ordnance survey map on the other, we can use this slider to gradually fade between the two types of map. So the aerial photography is great, but actually it is only a picture and it only tells part of the story. Similarly, the map is only a map and that only tells part of the story. So to be able to fade between the two is very useful. When we look further out and we look at the historical maps, you can also see how useful they are to have the 1950s map on one side and the contemporary map on the other side. So I'm going to start with the, um, the 1890s map on one side and the 1950s on the other. I'm going to slide between the two here. So 1890s Newton Grange was non-existent. It's a mining town, so the mines haven't taken off. As we get to the 1950s, you can see how this little town grows up quite significantly. And then if we put the contemporary map back on this side, we can then slide back again to see what Newton Grange looks like now. So as you can see, all this rural patch here by Cockpen Farm and all this housing up by Mayfield, the Bryans, has all grown up since the 1950s. Quite a great expansion. If you're looking at things like the growth of new towns after the Second World War and the 1948 New Towns Act, this is a really useful thing to, to be able to do. Look at places like Milton Keynes or Stevenage or Harlow, um, Welling Garden City, lots of places, certainly the, the sort of towns outlying London, you'll see the growth in, in them between 1890s, 1950s and current um, contemporary maps will be quite significant. It's a really interesting thing to look at. Um, what we could do here too, uh, by way of example, let me just search for Milton Keynes because that's a useful one to show. I'm going to do a search for Milton Keynes, find Milton Keynes on the map here, close the, the tab and I'm going to look at the contemporary map now so we can see how big Milton Keynes is at the moment. I'm going to use my drawing tools with a shape here to measure a shape around, roughly around the sort of urban area that makes up sort of Milton Keynes, I hesitate to call it a conurbation because that's maybe over egging it a bit, but it is a fairly substantial urban area. And we'll just go around the edge like that. And then if I move my slider down to the 1950s map, you can see the outline that I've drawn in purple there shows the area that is now covered by an urban extent. And you can see underneath how the little villages have actually got merged together. If we go even further back and draw the 1890s map, you can see that actually not a huge amount of change between 1950s and 1890s, but, but there is some. But compare that with the modern day map, and actually it's quite a significant urbanization. A good bit of history there. A quick pause for any questions. If you've got any questions, please type them into the chat and we'll um, We'll, we'll get to them as, as quickly as we can. There may be some things that I can answer verbally as we go along. Um, we do also have some learning resources in our um, web pages that will help you with the use of the historical maps. We've got one on um, Hornsey and one relating to the place where grandma used to live or what grandma remembers. And um, something. I think there's an item on the closure of the railways. Emma, uh, there's a question from Claire. Uh, can you show where the map selector tool is kept again, please? Yes, yeah, so the map selector tool is in the top left hand corner of the map itself. So it's a little green button. So sometimes on some backgrounds, it's quite hard to see. But you can see if you click on it, you then get the drop down list and that will slide between the two different maps. And then you can click on it again and the drop down disappears back up there. Thank you. There's another question from Mark. Uh, is the historical maps the same for other countries? No, so the only global maps we have are the uh, world panorama, which are, are contemporary maps. So the historical maps only apply to Great Britain. Uh, there's another question, just bear with me, uh, from Charlotte. Will there be time to show us any ways we can use this in early years? P possibly, possibly, possibly. We do have some early years um uh, learning resources which we could we can dig out to show you but I'm, I'm not sure we'll have time to go over that in any detail today 
but happy to answer questions um, separately on that another time. Uh, we have another question here. Um, how do I select specific measurements, uh, elements to remove them, but not the rest? Uh, so removing things, let me draw a few extra bits on this map just for the sake of drawing extra bits. So I can show you what to delete. Um, let's draw a couple of triangles as well, just because we can. So if you want to delete particular things, there are three delete options here. Either you can delete everything, which is the first button here. And if I do that, it'll say, do you really want to delete everything? Because if you, if you delete it all, you're going to have to draw it again. So do be very sure before you delete it. Um, or you can delete on click, or you can delete selected ones. So if I had selected a number of different items, so I'm going to select um, that one. And if I hold down my control key, I think I can you know, select shift key, I can select more than one, um, or I can draw a box around selected ones like this. Oh, so I then click the selected delete button and it will delete the ones that are selected, or I can choose the delete on click. So that is a useful one where you can delete individual items just like this. So one at a time. Uh, another question here from Jonathan. Is this for one terminal? All pupils need to do this on the same computer, not their own devices? Um, if you are, if you have a class where all the pupils have their own devices, they will be working on their own device and they will be working on their own map. So it, you have one map per device in that sense. If you were to put it on a whiteboard on a or smart board or something, and everybody's working on the same map they can see. But actually, if you have all, all the pupils with their own device, they're only working on the map that they can see in front of them. We have another question here uh, from uh, Gita. Is there any resources for SEND slash nonverbal children which teachers can access to plan for differentiation? We don't have any specific SEND or nonverbal um, resources, no. That's something we should look into. Can we talk to you about that? Um, after this, because I think that would be useful for, us to, useful for us to know what you would find most useful. We have another question here um, from Jenny. Is there any suggestion of how to protect pupil data if other can access the maps? This is a very, very tricky question, Jenny. Um, we've battled with this for a, for a long time. Um, because you only have one username and password for the whole school to access the service, there isn't any option for a degree of individual pupil personalization. It's just not technically possible to do that if you have one username and password because we can't differentiate between one person logging in and another person. So, which is why we say we op offer you the option to withdraw the saved maps completely so that nobody can share anything. If you wish to keep the saved maps, it, it has to be up to you to manage what data goes into that. that there's, there's nothing we can do to control it because we can't tell who's logging in, if that makes sense. Um, it's not fair of us to stop you putting particular bits of information on the map because that would defeat the point in, in having the options to do that. Um, but we are aware that it, it can be an, an issue. Um, the counter argument is that we create a username and password for every single pupil. And that comes with not only headaches for us, but bigger headaches for you. Um, it, there isn't a universal username and password system for everybody that works the, uh, across the across the UK. So until we get into um, working with things like social media logins and open auth and so on, it, it doesn't really work to have one username and password per pupil, which is the only real way you get to lock down that personal data thing to each individual person. So it's, it's a very tricky one. We've chosen to take this line on the basis that it's it's worked reasonably well for 12 years now, but we're always looking at ways to improve that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Mingochen here. Uh, if you hide the save maps bar, does that mean you can't save ones that you're working on either? That is correct because you can't access the save maps button. Um, and Jenny um, here says, if it's only teachers with the pin, does that mean that teachers only can hide and see the maps? Um, it, only the teacher can add and remove the saved maps button. If the saved map section is visible, then everyone will be able to see it. But only the teacher with the pin can remove it or make it visible. That makes sense. Okay. 
Um, keep thinking of your questions, keep typing them in. I will carry on with my script now so that we can we can crack through everything. Um, we've looked at the historical maps. Um, there are also some good learning resources we have about developing place knowledge with um, things like land use maps and story maps. They're also worth, worth a look. Uh, let's move on to the buffer tools here. First of all, I'm going to clear all my drawings from this map so that I don't get confused. I'm just going to delete all the drawings there. That's everything gone. And I'm going to start again with the GB map. Um, let's go back to Newton Grange because that's where we were before. And my maps are based on that. Um, let's look at the buffer tools first. So the interesting thing about the buffer tools is that you can have either a circular buffer or you could have a linear buffer. So the circular buffer might come in handy for things like uh, you need to know how many stations lie within a 10 mile radius of somewhere or how many churches there are within a five mile radius, all sorts of questions like that. So the, the buffer tools are available under the drawing tools here and there's a button here that says buffer tool. So if I click on that and then I'm going to pick my school here, which is Newton Grange Primary School right in the middle, um, I'm going to enter a buffer radius, so I'm going to put a one mile buffer on it. So if we are looking at things like catchment areas, maybe we could see who lives within one mile of our school. So then I click on the school itself with my little blue dot and it will draw me a circle that is one mile in radius. So I then might want to plot um, a number of that could be um, it could be pupil addresses, it could be um landmarks it could be museums it could be stations it could be post boxes anything you like you could plot plot the um the points of those data there and see how many of them lie within that buffer and how many lie without it i'm going to remove that circle now for the purposes of the next one the alternative is to use a linear buffer this might be useful for things like flooding on a river or noise pollution along a road or um oh crikey can't think now those two are good examples. So we're going to choose the line buffer tool here, and I'm going to pick something like 200 meters, oops, not 1200, 200. I'm just typing the, the distance in here. I'm going to put a 200 meter buffer along it, and I'm going to use this river here as my example. So let's say we know that we don't want houses within 200 meters of the river, because if we build houses within 200 meters of a river, they will flood because that's, that's something that we know. So I want to know how much of the field I can or can't build in. So I'm going to click along this river here to draw the line in the same way as I drew the other lines on the map previously. So I'm just going to keep clicking until I get all the way along the river. And I'm going to double click to finish in just a second. Double click there. And then it will draw me a 200 meter buffer from the line that I've drawn. As I zoom in, of course, you can then start to see whether there are already any houses within 200 metres of the river that are going to flood. So these houses here at Cathcoles, Cathcoles Wood might, might get a bit wet. Um, Dalhousie Castle might get a bit wet, although one would, would assume that if it was a castle, it was probably built well out of the floodplain. Um, useful examples for things like noise pollution from roads or um, if you were examining the impact of a new road on wildlife, for example. Um, how how far have your hedgehogs got to get across a, a road or, or something similar? Okay, so that's the buffer tools. I'm just going to delete those now as well, just to unclutter my map. I'd like to show you the geograph image search next. In the left-hand panel here is a little blue camera icon. So if we click on this one, it gives us an option to image search. So the geograph images are a big bank of images taken by uh, a number of different contributors. They are crowdsourced images, so anybody can sign up to the geograph website and add their own photographs. Photographs are taken uh, at different points over the last 20 or so years. Um, they are tagged with a location and some information about the picture, what it might show, whether it shows this church or that church or a new railway or whatever. Um, and therefore, what we do is to allow you to search those that that's um, information that's associated with the, the images. So to search for all images, the simple thing to do is put in a star in this search box. I've got quite a big area here, so there are too many pictures for it to show. But if I zoom in, I'm just going to use my scroll wheel to zoom in here, you'll find that the number of pictures reduces to a number that's manageable. 
single images will pop up as a little black camera icon and the green circles with a number in them tell you how many other pictures there are hiding under that green dot. So uh, thumbnails of the images will appear in the uh, left hand column here and you can click on any one of these camera icons and it will bring up a little um, sample image. If you click on the image itself, you then get the full extent of the image here. Unfortunately, these are some of these pictures are so big, we can't fit them all into a window on the screen. Um, but you can go and look on the Geograph website here, which will show you what the picture looks like originally. It also gives you uh, the location of the picture and the, and the photographer and the date the picture was taken. So we can just close the picture here in this top corner. As I said, you can skim around a bit, let's zoom out a bit, and you can see where all the pictures are. Um, this particular patch is quite interesting because they were building the reopening the original Scottish Borders Railway here. So you get lots and lots of pictures of the new railway line as it was being put in. I haven't yet trawled this enough to work out when, whether anybody took any pictures of the same place before the railway went back in to see what it used to look like. But there will be examples of that. The Geograph website is constantly being updated. So there are people always adding new images to, to it, which means you're more likely to get those historical comparisons now. If you wanted to search for a particular thing or pictures of a particular thing. So let's try the word church because that's an obvious thing to, to search for. I can type church in here. And as I zoom out a bit, you might find that we get more hits. So there's a church here which has 17 photographs taken of it. So let's click on that to zoom in. This is Cockpen Church, so we can have a picture of it there. If I click in the, on the thumbnail in the left hand panel, it will highlight the picture on the map too. So there's a picture of the door and so on. Um, again, we rely on the tags that the geograph folks have put against those photographs. So um, there's only so much control we have over what you will find when you search for a particular term. Uh, but it is quite a useful, useful function to have. Moving on, um, we talked about the buffer zone and how you might want to add a number of points to your map straight off. So what we can do is to show you how to add your own data set um, all in one go rather than having to plot individual points. So this red button on the left hand side, it looks like a looks like a first aid point actually. I'm not quite sure with why we've got it looking at like a first aid point, is add your own data. So to add your own data, you can construct a comma separated file, or you can do it in Excel, which comprises a, a location, so say a postcode or a grid reference, and a label field. So you have two columns effectively in your Excel spreadsheet, and the postcode will act as your, or your, your location field will allow you to plot the data, and then the label field will allow you to, to label the points that you've uploaded straight off. So let me show you a quick example of the CSV file that I've got, so you can see it. Uh, so this one. So I'm just opening my Excel file, and you can see what I mean about um, about this. Like that. As you can see, I've got two columns in my Excel spreadsheet. One is the grid ref, and one is the label. If I wanted to use postcodes, that's fine. I can use postcodes in this field. Our help pages will give you detailed instructions on how to create this, this file so that it will upload properly. I'm just going to put that out of the way for the moment. I go to the Add Your Own Data um, tab on the left-hand panel. I click the Browse button and I find my CSV file here. And I click Open and I click Import and it will then go away, take the point data that I've put in that Excel spreadsheet and it will upload it to the right, right place. So as you can see here, each of the lines in that Excel spreadsheet now corresponds to a point on the map. If I go back to the drawing tools now, I can select them all using a box here. I'm just going to drag a big box over my whole map and you'll see that all my little points turn yellow. I'm going to turn these all into blue dots like that, and then if I click anywhere to unselect them, it hasn't turned them into blue dots, it's turned them into purple dots. There's always something unexpected, isn't there? Anyway, they're circles rather than um, pins, so that, that's fine. That's how you add a number of points all at once. Similarly, I can add 
routes or lines, if I have that, if anybody has any kind of um, GPS device, either a, 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 GP, a handheld GPS or you have a, um, uh, a, a running watch, a fitness watch, a Fitbit, or if you use an app like Strava or something on your phone, you can create um, a trail using, using that that will allow that you can then plot on this map. So here's one I've done earlier. Um, this is maybe a, a bit of a niche use, but it's, it's useful to know that it can be done. If you have a, a, a fitness tracker of some sort, you should be able to download from it something called a GPX file, and that will allow you to plot this on here. So I can just go to the add data again, and I can click browse, and I can find my GPX file here, and I can open it, and it will add the root onto that. So I'm going to open that annotation. We should see it appear in a second. So as you can see, there's the purple line there. So if I select that, go to the drawing tools, select that with the little grab hand, I can then change its weight and its color like this. So it stands out as a big red line. That's a way you can add data um, fairly easily, assuming you have the original source. OK, um, another pause for questions. Have we got time, Laura? Uh, yes. Uh, so I have a question here from Jonathan. Uh, could you please explain the CSV file? Thanks. Right, CSV stands for comma separated version, I think. So you can create a CSV file using Excel. So here is the file here. All you need to do is to put um, the two headings in, the, so put your data in the two columns like this. And when you do a file and save as, you get to choose the comma delimited option here from this drop down. It's rather than saving it as an Excel workbook, save it as comma delimited.csv. That's the format that it needs to distinguish between one row and one item in each row. Between, yeah, distinguish between the items in the row. Does that um, does that help? It's a particular format that you, you can create that will allow Digimap schools to understand the data you're trying to put in it. Does that help? You can do it in Notepad too, actually. So let me show you this by way of example. So I could put postcode, comma, label, and then hit return key, and then I could put in my postcode, a, co a comma and a space, and then um, my house, and then return, and I could put in another postcode, and put in granny, and I could put in uh, labels like that. So if you've got the comma in the in between the two items and a, a, a return at the end of each row, you can also save that to a file, save as, and you can put them, oh, let me just show you this, you can put the um, manual .csv at the end, like that, and that would also work. Okay, I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Um, we can come back to that uh, another time if that's, if that's still a, an issue. Um, any more questions? That's all good. Okay, uh, let's move swiftly on. Let me show you how to print next. That's easier. So print button is here on the top panel. What this actually does is generate a file for printing. It doesn't automatically send the map to your printer. So you're not using up printer credits or paper or ink by hitting the print button. If I hit the print button here, I get a dialog box that allows you to construct your print file. So first you can give it a name. I'm just going to call it my map. You can add your own name to it if you wish, but it's not compulsory. So I'll leave that blank. You can get the print scale to be the exact scale that you see it on the, on the screen, or you can round it up to the nearest sort of sensible scale. It depends what, what you want. So if I round it up, it goes up to once 25,000. I then have options between a PDF file and a JPEG file. So a JPEG is just an image whereas a PDF will allow you to um, do other things with it. Um, I can pick A4 or A3. 
and I can pick portrait or landscape. I can choose to add, so include the drawings I've added to the map, or I can take them off like that. And you can see in the preview on the right hand side that the drawings will include or not. You can choose to add national grid lines, which is sometimes useful if the map you're looking at does not already have the national grid lines printed on it, because some of them do. The key thing here is to look at the two tabs on the right hand side, one of which is the content preview and one is the layout preview. So the layout preview will give you an idea of what area your map will cover. So if you've got annotations on it like this, the drawings that you've added, you won't want to make sure that, the whole, that all your drawings are included on the map, in which case you can just drag this around a little bit to center it, make sure that they're all on there. The content preview will give you an, an idea of what the map you're going to print actually looks like. So I'm going to do a hit generate print file now. This will generate a file that I can then look at. And then if I like it, then I can send it to the printer. If I don't like it, I can just delete it and start again and no harm done. So click generate print file. And this should generate me a PDF, which will show you what the final map will look like. So it comes with its proper borders, comes with its title. It's got both the cardinal scale and the scale bar. It includes the date and the time, and it includes your school name in the bottom uh, left hand corner too. As you can see, all the annotations that I added to it, all the drawings I added to it are there. Um, and I've got all of them in, in place. If I like that map, I can now choose to send it to the printer using whatever my browser allows you to do. So everybody's browser might be slightly different, but you can use, usually just print it from there. If you wanted to um, generate a JPEG file, you could add it to a Word document or add it to a PowerPoint presentation and then print it from there, of course. OK, and now I'm going to struggle to close that from under there. OK, uh, we've got another couple of questions out individual elements within a buffer zone, e.g. every car park symbol within a buffer zone. Ah, now, um, you would need to produce a CSV file first to overlay it on the buffer zone. So the maps you're looking at here are what we call raster maps. They're like looking at photographs. They are effectively dumb images. They don't um, have any detailed um, knowledge about the things that they are depicting. So if you see a picture, if you see a um, uh, a museum or a castle marked on the map, the drawing doesn't know it's a museum or a castle. It is just a drawing. So if you wanted to pick out particular things within a buffer zone, you would have to add those things to the map first as a, as a point data set in the same way I showed you adding the, the CSV upload. Okay, good, that makes sense, right. Okay, let's move on to, um, showing you the global maps. I'm going to delete all my drawings again, just to clear things up. And then we're going to zoom right out to show you the global maps. So again, I've clicked this full extent button underneath the zoom bar on the right hand side, and that allows you to zoom right out. So I'm also going to do a, a, an international search. Let's search for Mount Everest. So as far as global maps are concerned, we have three different options. We have this green one, which is the World Panorama data set created by Collins Bartholomew. Under the map selector, you will also see World Boundaries, which is a data set created by a company called Natural Earth. This is quite a simple data set, very good for showing things like national boundaries and so on, but there isn't much detail once you get further in. There's, there's some, but not as detailed as what we have for, for Great Britain. And if we keep going in, we get to the, um, to the uh, World Panorama Atlas data again, and if you keep going in a bit further, we eventually get to something called OpenStreetMap data. OpenStreetMap is a crowdsourced data set, so it varies in terms of content depending on where you are. In very urbanized areas, you'll find the data is pretty good. It's very like the stuff that we have, the most detailed data we have for, for Great Britain. In much more rural and less less populated areas, you'll find that there is much less information there. It is a crowdsourced data set. People will map the bits they're interested in. They're usually interested in the bits where people live. And if there are fewer people living there, then there are fewer people interested in the, the detail. But it is still there nonetheless. So if we search for Mount Everest there, I can click on that and you'll see that Mount Everest is marked in the middle of the Himalayas. And as I zoom in, you'll see that there's not really a huge amount of information there because nobody lives on Mount Everest. 
that's probably not true actually i bet there are people who live there not all the year but for a good chunk of the year as we zoom out again you'll see that the the data changes so that we get to the more the, the atlas style data if we search for another place like uh let's search for the eiffel tower if i could spell eiffel that would help there we go this also appears in our global landmarks um section if i click on the eiffel tower and it will find it in the middle of paris i'm going to close the search box there as i zoom in you'll see that the open street map data appears and it is pretty good pretty detailed if we keep going We'll find the Eiffel Tower again, which I've now lost. Let's find it again. I wasn't so far out. And then as we zoom right in, you can see that there is as much detail here in the open data as there is for, um, for, for Great Britain. So this level of detail doesn't exist for across the whole world, but it will exist in most major cities, most major um, urbanized areas. Okay, so what we could do here is find the latitude and longitude of the um, of the Eiffel Tower. So in the bottom of this left hand panel, you'll see a little I button, and this will give you all the information about the map that you're looking at. So this applies to both Great Britain and and the global maps. As you I move my mouse over the map, you can see that the latitude and longitude um, location is changing. Grid reference and the British National Grid references there are not applicable because we're not over Great Britain. Obviously, if you want to do a coordinate capture, so you can click this button here, click on the middle of the talk to IFL, and you'll see that the button that the location freezes. So I can now move my mouse around without changing the location. That will allow you to copy and paste the uh, the, the location of your particular item using using that method there. So you could either have it in latitude, longitude, degrees, or in decimal degrees. If we were to go over to the UK, let's zoom out quite a lot and shift the map over here. We'll see that the, um, across the channel, there we go. We'll see that the um, extra fields here for the grid reference in the British National Grid are also filled in there. As you zoom in, why is that popped up? You can see that my mouse changes as it runs over the map there. Okay. We talked already about adding the grid reference marker point. So under the drawing tools, you've got a grid reference here. So again, you can use that to add a grid reference and that will depend upon the scale of the map that you're looking at as to how detailed a grid reference it will give you. Uh, next, I want to show you some overlays. The overlays tab here is on the left hand side. It's the three layers of orange. We have a number of different overlays. Some are just over Great Britain and some are for uh, the global maps. Let's start with the GB ones because they're um, right here. I mentioned earlier that we have moved the aerial, the X bit from the aerial X layer into here. And that is um, the roads and place names layer that you see here. So I'm going to just put the aerial maps on, on here for a minute so you can see what I mean. Um, the roads and place names is an extra layer that just allows a bit more context to the aerial photographs. The aerial photographs are of course just pictures and they don't have any names and things on them. So we've created this layer that allows you to see where places are, um, even though you're just looking at a picture. However, they also are quite useful when you look at the historical maps. So certainly when you look at the development of larger roads, these are quite hard to see, I'm afraid, because of the different colourings on them. But you can see there that there's, there's a, an old road running down the middle from Weavers down there right across to, to Greatham. But the new bit of the road cuts cross country right across here, whereas clearly in the 1890s that road didn't exist. So there's a number of um, things to discuss there with the development of our road network over, over time and so on. Even when we take the 1950s map, we might find that those roads are not where they are now. So the roads and place names is quite useful over the aerial photography. Um, we've also got the British National Grid overlay. That will change as you zoom in and out, of course, to make it 
for scale specific. Um, there's not much point in looking at a one kilometer grid if you're trying to look at the whole of Great Britain because it would just be a big blur. Similarly, there's not much point in you looking at a hundred kilometer grid if you're looking at the middle of a town. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see anything. The um, postcode overlay is very interesting. So this will change according to the, uh, the, the zoom level you're at as well. So we start with the, um, the postcode areas, which are the big ones. Uh, as you zoom out, you can start to see them a bit better there. These are quite tricky to see because the map underneath is quite dense. These are the postcode areas. And as I zoom in, you'll find that we suddenly start to get postcode districts, which are the SPV bit, not just SP. As I zoom in a bit more, you then start to get the postcode sectors, which will be SP35 or SP34 there. And then eventually, as we move in to uh, somewhere a bit more urban, we'll find that the postcode units themselves appear, which is the individual postcodes. So a postcode comprises roughly 15 delivery points, and they can be either residential or, or commercial. But once you zoom in right down here, you can start to see um, the size of the different postcode units and so on. Let's put the um, OS data underneath. You can maybe see them a bit a bit more easily. Every so often you'll see little squares. They look like perfect squares, postcodes that are marked as perfect squares. These are what we call vertical streets and they apply to buildings where there is more than one postcode in any one building. So often apply to tower blocks of, of flats and so on, or large commercial premises where one building has got multiple postcodes in it or multiple delivery points. But those are quite interesting to, to have a look. Postcodes are not, um, drawn based on geographical features. They are mathematically calculated, which is why they often look as though they don't really make much sense. They're not calculated with any logic in that sense. They are a mathematical arrangement. Um, once we get out to a global level though, we've got some much more interesting overlays on world climate and human geography and physical geography. Um, I have to be careful not to go off on one on my favorite, which is the population density one. If we zoom right out though, I'll just drag my slider bar out here so we can have a much better view of the globe. The world climate overlays will cover things like temperature, both average for um, past dates and average predict, pre, uh, predicted, projected um, dates. So 21 to 2040, for example, it will give you an idea of what, how hot the world might be in different places. And you could compare that with how hot it has been in the past. So there's some interesting changes to be uh, seen there. Um, we've also got uh, the world human geography layers here. This is where my favorite is, is the world population density. This is fabulous, just being able to see where the world's population lives in its greatest density. And there are so many conversations to be had about why that's the case, what might change it, what the impact of different things might be. Um, the classic example here, of course, is Egypt and the Nile Delta. Um, it, Egypt, uh, since ancient Egyptian times, has been known as that the Nile is known as the source of life in, in, in Egypt. And this illustrates it. I can't think of a better way of illustrating it than this. All of Egypt's population lives along the river or along the delta. And this is a really stark um, illustration of that. Similarly, um, I think the idea that the population in northern India is really dense and then it suddenly stops as they get up to the Himalayas. There are physical geological barriers as to why the population doesn't spread out more. So there's lots and lots and lots of conversations to be had about that. Um, we also have the world time zones. This is quite useful for thinking about how uh, what happens when people travel. If you were to travel from one side of the United States to the other, how many time zones do you cross and why? And can you see why some countries align themselves with some time zones and, and instead of others? Some more conversations to be had there. But we also have the physical geography overlay, overlays. Um, the world biomes is an interesting one. This is um, created by the World Wildlife Fund. So there's more information in the link here on the left-hand panel. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. Also to note that there is an information tool in the top here, a little uh, magnifying glass, Click on that and you can click on any of the world biomes here and it will tell you what the world, what the biome is and give you a bit more information about it. And that's a, a, a useful function. So 
we need to go to deactivate that button to turn it off. Um, we've also got um, mountain ranges and uh, volcanoes and tectonic plates, both boundaries and the plates themselves. So this is where you start to see the coincidence of the tectonic plate edges and the volcanic activity. Um, I'm sure I don't need to say too much about, um, about that. We've also added here in the reference grids at the bottom, which is the latitude and longitude, the pennies off, and the major lines of latitude there. So you can see the major lines of latitude in the middle, topic of Cancer, Capricorn, and the equator, and the Arctic Circle, and somewhere down there is the Antarctic Circle. There we go. Um, but the latitude and longitude grid will also change as you zoom in and out. So that will get smaller as you zoom in, larger as you zoom out. Um, if you're looking over Great Britain, you'll also have the reference grids for uh, the British National Grid there. So the British National Grid appears twice in these overlays. There you go. And as you, if you look at Great Britain from this level out, if you like, you can start to see the impact of the curvature of the Earth um, on the grid. And as you zoom in, of course, it starts to straighten out a bit because you're not looking over a sufficiently wide area. OK, um, I think that's a whistle stop tour. I'm seven minutes over. Um, Quick last thing to say, follow us on our social media channels. Um, we have both Twitter and Facebook and um, Instagram and YouTube. And uh, Laura will kick me if I get this wrong. Um, our YouTube channel is uh, full of videos. Uh, this one will go onto the uh, YouTube channel once we've processed it so that you can watch this again. There are lots of videos showing you how to do individual things as well, short videos, a couple of minutes long, nothing. Uh, significant. So if you want to have a look at how to do a particular thing, do look at the YouTube channel and do look at our help pages. It's broken down into very short sections on how to do individual things. Okay, I'm conscious you guys have all had probably had a day at school and will be wanting to get home for uh, a cup of tea and a biscuit or something equally nice. Um, do drop us a line at any time with any questions you have. Um, we're very happy to answer anything by email. Um, do phone the help desk too if you need passwords or pins or anything like that. I'm happy to stick around for a couple more minutes if there are last minute questions, but if not, thank you for your time. <laughs>